Hello and welcome to The Rabbit Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. If you want to learn how to support the channel and its mission to normalize atheism and deconversion, stay tuned to the end of the video. Uh, boy, uh, today... I feel caught by myself because I, at the beginning of the week, I said, you know, this is, you know, the debate's coming up. This might be a good week to start talking politics. And I've been doing a little research into Project 2025, and I kind of wanted to th talk about that a little bit at the beginning of the week. And then the presidential debate happened. And I have been watching over the last couple of days as every liberal atheist channel I know of has been losing its shit. <laughs> okay. The amazing atheist took to the air immediately after the debate and said, oh, we're going to lose. <laughs> we are going to so lose. And it's time to vote for somebody else. Time to vote green because at least then I'm, I'm sticking with my principles. And it's like, okay, I, I, I can buy that, you know, sticking to your principles. And I'm thinking to myself today, I've been struggling to try to do this because, you know, my rabid reflections is very unscripted. And I feel like I should be very scripted on this one, but I'm not gonna, I'm gonna stick to that rule where I'm being a little bit more unscripted and it's more me. I'll, I'll cut out some of the dead spaces, of course, as I always do, but oh boy, was that painful to watch. I have not been able to watch the debate all the way through. I get about 15 minutes in and I have to shut it off and I haven't finished. How do you tell me that you're overprepared for a debate and you should have injected your candidate with some lucidity drugs before he took the stage without telling me you needed to do that? I agree with a lot of people. I, I was watching Arn Ra. He, he did a thing about Orwellianism and conservatism before the debate, and I agree with a lot of that. Uh, a lot of his observations I agreed with. I also think he missed some of the points that sometimes the left can be very Orwellian too. At times, Orwellianism is is the product of politics, where people want to control things, so they want to control language and narrative, and both sides try to control the language and control narrative. So, how do you though? The beauty of debates is you they're live, and you can't control them, and you can't really undo them. Okay, they happen and they have, you know, when you release a, com a political commercial, that's an edited, hopefully th well thought out thing. When you, when you are as an administration or a potential administration, you come up with your plan and that's a, a document and it's well thought out and edited and you can deal with it and you can, if there's something that people disagree with it, you can come along and add explanation and notes and you can run another commercial. With a debate, that stands forever and there's nothing you can flip and do about it which is why to the American public, they're very important. How do you throw a presidency, not in 90 minutes, in 15 minutes? Do what Joe Biden did. In 15 minutes, he had thrown the presidency. He had thrown the debate, and he had thrown his chances at a presidency under the bus. Oh, you're overreacting. No, I, I, I'm known for my non-overreaction. And when you go to the panel after the debate, and there's a whole bunch of liberal Democrats sitting there going, oh my God, what just happened? You have a problem. When you have the political movers and shakers in the Democrat party starting to ask the question, how do we get Biden to step down from running? When you have a majority of them doing that, that's not good. Okay, and I'm, I'm trying to be as analytical here as possible. I'm trying, is there any hope for this thing to win? It's because I, I have a few questions for liberals, you know. What are you willing to do to change the Biden presidency? I mean, can, you, can it be salvaged? Can it be saved at this point is a really, really good question. Because Biden barely won last time. And he barely he squeaked it. Okay, if you want to be honest about how that election went, you did not win a landslide. A lot of the American people did not want Biden as president. Not a majority. And certainly the Electoral College win was his, which I agree with the Electoral College. You can fight me on that, but... We have 50 separate elections for president, and you have to have a way to reconcile that. That's both fair to each state's rights and also takes into account population. And the Electoral College is a bad way to do it, but it's better than anything else that's been proposed, in my opinion. So this is the way it is. It's what the rules of the game right now. And so he won the Electoral College, and he, he won the popular vote, barely. 
So a lot of a lot of Americans didn't want him. Okay. And the problem is the Biden presidency, as good as you want to make it out to be, I've heard all kinds of people going, oh, great presidency. I beg to differ. I think his foreign policy has been a joke, but it's been an absolute disaster from Afghanistan onward. And he's still not learning from it. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know who's running his foreign policy department, but they all need to be sacked, fired, you know, in American he's sacked in Europe, English terms. <sighs> And I know my UK and Australian fans are kind of looking at this and going, what the hell is going on in America? And I agree with you, what the hell is going on in America? And I look at something like Project 2025, and I think, you know, and I hear the liberal rhetoric of, man, the Trump presidency would be the greatest threat to the democracy and the republic ever. And this makes this the most important election ever. It's always the most important election ever, by the way. Um... I lived through Trump's presidency once before, and there were people of like mind that would have wanted to do something like Project 2025. If you want to know what that is, just look it up. AI will give you all kinds of conversations about it, trying to put it in the most positive light, um, <laughs> like AI tends to do. Um, I don't know what to say. You say all that, that this is a, and then you're still backing a candidate that I don't think can win. I don't think he can win now. I think Biden is a, lo is a loser at this point. He barely won last time. People need, let me put it in scoreboard terms. You know, if, you, if, if you need some sort of analogy of how close the last election was, it was a soccer game that ended in a 2-2 draw, and the last penalty kick, the last kick to break the tie because it has to be broken, Biden won on the last kick in the upper corner that tipped off the tips of the goalie. That's how close it was, okay? If you need a football analogy, American football analogy, the final score was 38 to 35, and they won by a field goal in the last second. That's how close it was. Trump beat Hillary and beat her handily, okay? I watched that election with a lot of like, oh my God, what's going on? Because the American people aren't about facts. Aaron Ra, I love you, man. But the one thing you still haven't understood about politics, despite all your experience, and I'm younger than you by a little bit, I'm looking at you, at you and going, dude, haven't you figured out that this isn't about facts? Just like religion, politics isn't about facts. That's why it's not government and politics shouldn't be trusted any more than religion is. That's why our founding fathers distrusted government when they wrote the Constitution. They restricted its powers. Every amendment in the Bill of Rights is a restriction on governmental power for a reason. And Aaron Ron and many others, you haven't figured this out. It's about perception, not reality. Just like religion, politics is about perception, not reality. And when you come out of a debate like that, the perception is, and it doesn't matter the fact that Trump spewed lies, that the fact checkers went off you know, if, if the factor checkers were a Richter scale, you know, it's like 9.0, 10, that Trump was, you know, if, if, if Trump had a Pinocchio nose, it would have reached out to the people that were asking the questions and knocked them out. <laughs> okay, that's how bad his lying was. And you Trumpers are going to get into the comments. And say, he's not lying. No, no, he's lying. He lied a lot. I mean, the biggest one is, I didn't sleep with a porn star. Seriously, dude? Really? <laughs> Do you think anybody really believes that? Do you think your own people really believe that? Maybe your diehard supporters do that think you're the next Messiah, but I'm thinking most moderates and most liberals are going, what the heck? And most conservatives are going, why don't you just own up to it, man? Everybody likes a good testimony story. I, I used to be a drunk and I used to be, you know, why don't you tell that story? You know, I used to be that way. I'm not that way anymore. I've realized the error of my ways. You would pick up so much religious support, Mr. Trump, it'd be amazing. Yeah, I did sleep with a porn star, and I'm reaping the percussions of that. But you know what? I've, I've seen the light, and I've turned over a new leaf. But he doesn't do that. He tries to deny everything. And it's ridiculous, okay? And as ridiculous as he was, Biden so fumbled the ball. If the debate was a soccer game, or it would have been, Biden literally standing at midfield and not doing anything. Looking too tired to even handle the ball. <sighs> okay. And Trump, for all his faults, the fact that he, he says he won the debate 10-0, probably. Eh, it's more like a one nothing. 
okay, and only because your opponent just stood there and was very ineffectual. You know, you want an American football score? I, I, would, I would rate that one as a, a, a 14 to 3, <laughs> okay? It's not that Trump scored so much. It's Biden's offense did so little because he literally looked like a very, very old man that's just trying not to be ignored. And it doesn't matter what the facts are, what Trump said. It doesn't matter. It's perception. Politics is about perception. It's why the two candidates for presidency have a real perception problem. Nobody likes them from a perception standpoint. But Biden looks old. He looks tired. He doesn't look like he can hold a coherent sentence. So how is he going to make coherent decisions? You can sit there and say he's made all these great executive decisions all you want. But he doesn't look like that. That's he's the one making those decisions right now. It looks like his administration's making those decisions, not him. And maybe everybody should be thankful he put good people in those positions. Maybe that's a, a good thing. But is he going to do that next time? He doesn't look like he's a coherent, strong leader, and Americans love coherent, strong leaders. They like people that will get up on that stump and bang that gavel and, and rally them around it. They like leaders that they can rally to, and, and Biden just isn't that. He had troubles with that before, and now it's, any ability he had to rally truth. I, I saw his big grandiose speak Friday where he admitted it was a horrible experience and tried to rally the troops and everything. But I'm still getting from the pulse of the Democratic Party, no, 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 bro. <laughs> we can't have performances like he had on Thursday and expect to win this thing. Because I'm going to tell you, if I'm the Republican strategist, if I'm the Republican strategist right now, here's what I'm thinking. I'm being a purely political scientist. I'm salivating at the possibility of another debate. Because I know Joe Biden isn't a good debater, and if he debates like that again, I'm going to have a crap ton of sound bites to put in my commercials all the way up to election time. Is this the guy you really, really want to have president of the United States? He can't even put a sentence together. And as horrible as Trump is at putting sentences together, Biden is worse. I'm really trying to put a pretty face on it for you liberal Democrats. I really am, but there's no pretty face to put here. It was awful. I can't, I haven't been able to finish the debate because I get 15, 20 minutes in and I got to turn this off. It's just too stupid. <laughs> it's like watching Dumb and Dumber and it's not funny. And so I hear all you liberal atheists out there screaming and hollering. And here's my point for today. What are you willing to do to stop the tyranny now? That may be the title of the video. I don't know. I haven't picked a title yet because it becomes a question. Because you liberals, let's be fair, you are very anti Second Amendment. All oh, those founding fathers, they're brilliant in the First Amendment. They knew to keep religion and state separate. They knew to keep that, that press going. They knew to make sure people had the right to redress their grievances with government and petition and you know the right to assemble. Those are things that are necessary for an effective democracy to work until a crisis like COVID comes up. Oh, no, no, those rights, those aren't rights. Those are privileges granted by the government. And now you got to arguably one of the most vile human beings ever to be president. I, I, I stretch for that because I think Andrew Jackson sets the standard there, but um, going to be president and he's backed by a guy, people like Project 2025 that want to completely reshape the executive branch into something that will make religion government's business and is very anti-LGBTQ, very anti you know, wokeism, whatever the hell woke is. Somebody, can somebody in the comments give me a, a definitive definition of what woke is? Because I've been trying to find it, and I, it's why I don't talk about woke as much as I used to, because I can't find a good definition anymore. It seems to be just whatever I, I dislike is woke, and it, and the left and right both use it. So I guess I guess it's become another meaningless term. Um, kind of like putting phobia at the end of everything has become meaningless. What are you willing to do at this point? See, because you, you'll you'll sit there and talk about the brilliance of the First Amendment and brilliance of the Fifth Amendment. You know, how people are innocent until proven guilty and they have all these rights when they've been accused of a crime. You'll talk about how brilliant it is they uphold individual rights and that if the government isn't involved, you know, you'll talk about all the brilliances of the, of, the deck of, of the Bill of Rights until you get to the Second Amendment and suddenly the, suddenly the Founding Fathers were idiots. And I'm wondering if, like some groups did when Trump was first elected in 2016, you're going to realize how stupid a view that is. Because at the end of the day... It's got to be we the people. And I am not really sure that there's too many we the people that are willing to take up arms and spill blood to keep their freedoms anymore. 
us libertarians are, but we're too few in number, and we may just decide to leave the country. <laughs> okay, we just might decide to go somewhere else. And I know you Australians and UK. Well, we got rid of guns. Our guns, yes. And you're constantly in the danger of some part of your government becoming tyrannical. And when, what the hell are you going to do about it? If the government has all the guns, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. You're just going to have to live with it. And I watched atheist liberals, liberals in general, crusade against the, the free American citizen owning, being a responsible adult enough to own firearms, to take care of their own health care, to do all this stuff. Well, they're just, people are too stupid to do that. But people are smart enough that they should have the right to talk. And they should have, you know, it, it's a real interesting game that both sides play about, you know, what freedoms Americans are smart enough. You know, I got the religious right that all think we're all sinners. And so nobody can be trusted except for them, of course, about, you know, what rights should be given to people. But then I got this other side that says, you know, people are just, they're too stupid and you know, we're going to nanny state the thing to death because people are too stupid to take care of the retirement, too stupid. You know, if, if the government didn't step in and do those things, by necessity, they might have to. We're going to cradle the grave, everybody, and then wonder why they act like children, because they don't have to make adult decisions. And I'm wondering. See, because in 2016, when Trump was first elected, and 2017 started, several stories broke that I got very interested in. One was an LGBT group who suddenly decided to show up at a gun range. They all went out and exercised their Second Amendment rights and bought some firearms, and they wanted to learn how to use them. Because they came to the sudden re realization that there was no defense for them against the tyranny of a government that might go completely anti-LGBTQ, except the fact that they were going to make it very difficult for those people to take away their rights by force, if necessary. I learned something when I was in Texas. And for this, I am glad. This is one of the glad things. I'm glad I did that year and a half in Texas. Because I lived in a neighborhood that I would say was 70% Hispanic, about 25% African American, 4% Asian, and 1% token white people. And you know what I discovered? That minority groups have this instinctive understanding that at the end of the day, the majority can take away their rights. And because of that, holy crap, did those Texas minority groups own guns. <laughs> I was surrounded by guns. <laughs> and there wasn't a single white person in view most of the time. These minority groups understand and I think some of you liberal atheists need to come to this understanding, too. The only thing that stops the government from really getting after you as atheists is never going to be the First Amendment. It's how much you're willing to back up the First Amendment with the Second. See, because the Founding Fathers were just as brilliant with the Second Amendment as they were the First. They knew that the First Amendment is nothing more than ink on a page to a government who doesn't care about it. And you people are starting to see that there's a very real possibility of having a government in the United States that doesn't care about the First Amendment. So what are you going to do? What are you willing to do? So I'm getting preachy here now. The preacher's coming out. What are you going to do? Say bad words? You're going to riot as the back the blue crowd hands arms to the blue to take you out? Uses the police as a cuggle to wipe out opposition? What are you going to do? Oh, we can't stand up against that modern military. You're assuming which direction the modern military would go in such a situation. Last I remember, the last civil war that we had in the United States, they kind of split in half, and that's why there was a civil war in the first place. First thing a political scientist asks when they see a civil war breakout is who is the military backing? Because you can usually, 90% of the time, tell which way the war is going to go just by that. And the American civil war that happened, the military split in half. The South got not as many troops, but they got very brilliant commanders militarily. And the North got the crappy commanders, but they had the industrial might. And they had more troops. And it split in half, and that's why there was a four-year conflict in the first. If the military had gone North or South completely, there wouldn't have been a civil war. So you're assuming which direction the military is going to go. So you've got to put that right out of your mind. Let's say the military splits like it did last time. What are you going to do? Which side are you going to back? What are you going to do? See, the great mistake that both the right and the left make is they will look at certain amendments in the Bill of Rights and they will go, well, that was brilliant, but that's crap. The religious right doesn't like the First Amendment, and particularly they don't like the separation of church and state clause. They don't like the whole idea of this not being a Christian nation but being a secular nation at its founding, at its root level. They don't like that idea and they want to get rid of it. 
they don't like the First Amendment. When it comes to the press, when the press takes digs at the president, you know, Trump has never liked that. They don't like, but what backs up the First Amendment? It's just ink on a page without the second. And I'm wondering what it's going to take for you liberals to figure that out. That this isn't about school shootings. This is about the industrialized tyranny that can take away people's rights if they don't have the ability to defend themselves. You're gonna see it. Because I, I said it a, a video or two ago that I've watched in my lifetime that various issues have flip-flopped between the two parties. And I'm gonna tell you right now that the Republicans are gonna flip-flop a little bit on the Second Amendment. They're gonna say only certain citizens that measure up to our standard of what American is have the right to guns. And certain groups of people are gonna be denied them. That's what they did before. That's what people like that did before. And I'm wondering what it's gonna take for you guys to realize, oh, we gotta, we gotta rally around this election. We gotta stop Trump from being president so that we can avoid this tyranny. I have never felt an election threatened my individual liberties or rights ever. It's when government decide, it's when people think that government is the answer. That's really, really bothers me because the Republicans are looking as government the answer to their problems. Democrats are doing the same. And I really hate talking politics because I, you know, people will sit there and say, well, you know, you come out of religion, so you kind of see this connection between, because it's similar, but it's not the same. I, it is the same. If you look at human history, government came up with the rules. At the same time, religion put the eye in the sky. And they've been strange bedfellows ever since. And they always are. Trust me, if, if the Democrats switch their platform to something else that the religious right agreed with more, they'd switch sides. It doesn't matter to them. Religion is a parasite. It's, it's a prostitute that will sleep with whatever governmental force will give it power. If the government doesn't have the power to give it power in the first place, it's not a threat. I don't know what to, I, I don't know what else to say. You know, people say, well, why are you a libertarian? That's stupid. No, because I distrust government as much as I distrust religion for damn good reasons. The Founding Fathers distrusted government, and that's why they wrote the Bill of Rights the way they did. That's why they wrote the Constitution the way they did. They didn't trust government, and they wanted to restrict the power of government. Maybe who the president is wouldn't matter so much if he didn't have so much goddamn power. And it makes me angry, because I know what I'm willing to do if Trump gets elected and we start having this tyrannical bullshit that says, I, Ed Raby, as an atheist, can't have my channel on YouTube, because that's what it will come to. Because the way I'm reading the 2025 people, that's what they're after. They really want to shut me down. They, they're all for First Amendment rights for themselves, but not for me. And I have to ask the question to you liberals, what are you willing to do if Trump is elected? Because right now, I would say it's a layup dunk, to use another sports analogy, for Donald Trump right now. Because Biden is incredibly vulnerable, and he's incredibly weak, and he showed that weakness and that vulnerability on Thursday. And everybody saw it, and if I'm the Republican strategist, I'm thinking, we got this in the bag. As long as we don't do something stupid, which is still a possibility, that's why I'm not giving it 100% to Trump. But Biden, if you're going to support Biden, it, he's going to need a lot of support, more support than he's getting. And I don't think that amount of support exists. So what are you going to do when Trump's elected? What are you going to do when Project 22 starts implementing its 180-day plan? What are you going to do? You better, you know, if I'm a Democrat strategist right now, I'm saying, well, forget the presidency. Let's try to hold on to the Senate. Let's try to get the legislature back because it's the only defense we're going to have against Trump because we certainly can't go look to the courts for it. The Supreme Court's already in their corner. That's, that's pretty much, what are you going to do? Most important election against tyranny ever, and we still want to run Biden. Who's going to flip and lose? I love y'all. I, I, I think the world of you. Okay, this is not me yelling at you. I'm just asking a question. What are you willing to do if that happens? Are you going to finally see that the Founding Fathers were brilliant with every amendment in the Bill of Rights, finally? That that same intelligence that wrote the First Amendment is also responsible for the Second and the Ninth and many other amendments that sometimes you decry. I know it's not a perfect document. I'm not saying it is. But there's a brilliance behind it. There's a philosophy behind it all that gives we, the people, the power instead of the government. And too many of you liberals turn to the government to solve your problems, and that's the problem. It's, this government is not intended for that to be used that way. It's supposed to be the limited, necessary evil with a very specific purpose, not this all-encompassing nanny state, solve all our problems shit. What are you willing to do now, and what are you going to do? What are you willing to do? 
Because I'm going to tell you, if, if your attitude is, if we lose this election, the American Republic's over, then you, you've already lost. No matter what happens in the election, you already have a loser attitude. I played enough sports to know this, that that attitude will not win you long term. Now, am I worried about another Trump? Well, I survived the first Trump presidency and things got reversed in the end. And I don't know. I mean, I think the 2025 crowd is kind of looking at that as their last real moment. Because after that, the boomers, to put it mildly, are going to start diminishing in numbers, okay, at a rapid rate. We're already seeing it. And at some point, the boomers are going to be less numerous than Generation X, and that's what we're saying something. It's getting close. They're already less numerous than the millennials, and they're, they're getting smaller and smaller. And they're the ones back in Trump, and they're the ones back in the conservatives. And that's the issue. And I think they see 2025 as their last chance to really make some lasting impact on the government using the executive branch, and they want somebody like a Donald Trump. And you guys are sitting there, oh, if we lose this election, we've lost everything. And it's like, no, what are you willing to do? I haven't had any good yet. It's, it's why I'm nervous about standing with liberals, is because they talk a good game, but they're all show and no go when it comes to actually doing something to stand up to tyranny. They're not willing to shed their blood to protect liberty. They're not willing to water the tree of liberty with their own blood. And that comes out very often. On the flip side, I've got the conservative Christian nationalists who want to impose their religion, impose their viewpoint on everybody else in defiance of the First Amendment. And I got on the other side, I got another one that doesn't understand that the First Amendment is only ink on a page without the second. And I'm sitting here in the middle going, Jesus, what are you people willing to do to me? What, what, you know, I'm watching this debate and going, which freedoms are they threatening to take away now? And I'm saying that to both candidates. And it didn't really turn out to be that way. It was more of a, holy God, crap, can Biden even stand for this entire debate? <laughs> okay, he looked weak and feeble. And Trump did not. Here I am sitting there with that. Um, what, is there any other issues? Um, let's get back to religion. Um, I was going to talk about the 2025 project, but I think I've already laid out some of that. Uh, what my concerns are with that, uh, using the executive branch to create a Christian nation, basically, is what they're trying to do. A lot of the stuff I don't, some of the other stuff, you know, the various policies change. And I, I, I agree that there's some yin and yang there with some of the policy decisions that the Biden administration is, has made that haven't been good ones. But this week has been just basically annoying. I have annoying theists that keep saying the same thing over and over um, about religion. You know, it's like, my religion's the true one. I had somebody say to me, well, it's just a shame that you follow Christianity without being born again. And my, I wanted to respond then, but I'll respond now. What do you, it, it's a shame that so many of you go around in your life believing that born again is a real thing and not a fantasy. I also uh, had some really good reactions to a lot of the videos this week. I want to thank you guys for that. Uh, the conversations were pretty good. Uh, just an, another thing about the moderators. Um, I have moderators here because I can't read every comment anymore. I get too many. And so you need to understand that there's, when people become members of this channel and when they become moderators of the channel, they have a certain vision of what it is that they think the nation should be. Okay, And as citizens of that nation, as moderators of that nation, they enforce the comments that way. Now, I have my general rule is no ad hominem attack, don't attack the person. Um, try to be civil. You know, I believe in civility. I mean, trust me, my whole monologue up to this point, I could have used a lot of expletives to get across my point, but I try not to do that. And I try not to insult people directly. I'm just, I'm questioning motives right now. And that's usually what happens in my comment section, that people question your motives. Don't preach. Don't proselytize and don't engage in ad hominem attack and you'll probably be okay. Uh, at least that's the way I see my moderators acting right now. So there's that. Um, future of the channel, of course, this is the first day I've done political stuff. Uh, I feel it's necessary. I don't like being dragged into this. You know, I very much feel like, you know, the Godfather and Godfather 3 where he's like, or, you know, he's like, damn, every time I try to get out of this, they keep dragging me back in. And I feel like that, you know, as a guy with a political science degree, people expect me to say something. <laughs> and it's like, Jesus, I don't want to. It's a mess. What else do you want me to say? It's, it's, a, it's a mucked up, huge pile of BS, you know. What do you want me to say? I mean, I'm just going to take a shovel to this BS and try to clear it up a little bit. But still a polished turd, and it's a big one. Um, 
And so, yeah, I'm, I'm heading this direction reluctantly <laughs> and with great reservations and trying to be very careful, but I know that the moment I take a stand on an issue, somebody's going to be against it, okay? I'm just hoping that people respect the civility I'm trying to get out of talking about these issues because I really am genuinely just asking a question today, what are you willing to do to protect your liberties? What are you willing to do? Um, so that's the direction. Uh, uh, so next week I do have a couple reaction videos. My hope is to get my new computer within the next month. I think that's going to be a possibility once I get through July. And then what I want to do is do a live Bible study on Tuesdays and then by then I'll be done with my Jim Palmer series, Seeing Behind the Religious Curtain, and then I can move this lot into a Friday slot again where rabid reflection is, you know, politics, social stuff, and, you know, looking at deconversion more practically, kind of hit that as more of a, a live show. And then out of those two live shows, I'm hoping to find snippets, you know, things I can separate out with my editor and quickly edit and slap on a, a, Wednesday, a quick Wednesday, Saturday video. And still have videos like six days a week, but have one, two of them being products and then two of them live broadcasts and some other videos that are products of those live broadcasts. So hopefully that works out. Uh, my apologies. Uh, Sunday we were supposed to have this live forum. Um, me and Durante Lamar were going to get on with Tim Mills and kind of have a live panel discussion, but Tim Mills... Apologize profusely, but his computer was just having a lot of problems, and we just couldn't go live. So I apologize for for that if you came to that and it didn't materialize. But it was kind of a technical problem that became a very major one. So I apologize for that. Uh, you know, I've got a couple of reactions on tap today. I want to get back to Jordan Peterson on Thursday. I want to talk about his views on atheism in a recent interview with Pints of Aquinas. He talked about that. I've uh, Kentucky Atheist put me on to another video by uh, Darwin, what is it? Darwin to Jesus, his view on how to witness to atheists. We're going to see if that's any f effective. Um, Bible study, we're continuing on through the people of faith, um, heroes of faith. We'll see how that goes. And uh, we're getting down, in that study, we're getting down to the individuals mentioned to a whole list of people mentioned. And at that point, I'm just going to take the characters how the heck are these people of faith, uh, and why are they heroes for it? Um, that'll be this week. And then Friday, continuing on seeing behind the religious curtain, and who knows what Saturday will be, as it'll always be kind of like this, freewheeling. So, um, and I have to reemphasize, it's just my opinion. I'm always amendable to counsel. The one thing that you'll have to realize, though, is I'm pretty secure in my atheism now, and I have always been secure in my classical liberalism. So... Um, because I think it's more true liberalism than people, you know, giving individuals freedom is a far more important thing to do, and it's be it's best for society. That's always been my view, and I get pushed back on that all the time. Well, you, you, anarchy. I'm like, I'm not advocating for anarchy. I'm advocating for a small, limited government with a very specific purpose instead of the whole overall big general bullshit that it does. Um, that way, it can focus and do that well. And more for government being a referee than a player. And the problem right now is the government is a major player in most countries, and that's part of the problem. And it needs to go back to being a referee. Um, that's kind of where I'm at uh, with it. So uh, I think that's it for now. I uh, hope, hope you all understand where I'm coming from because I'm, I'm like looking at the election and saying, well, we have a dry pile of shit and a wet pile of shit, and neither one of them are good piles of shit. So... Um, you know, give me something else. Give me something better. I was talking with my daughter. Would you please give me a couple candidates that are at least Gen X level or millennial level instead of these old boomers that just keep fighting about the same shit? Okay, is there a different direction we can go? <laughs> okay, give me some different candidates. But nope, nope, the voters have decided a couple old guys that can't even, you know, keep their pants dry. Um, either one of them. So we'll see. Uh, well, that's it for today, so thanks for stopping by. Uh, there's lots of ways to support the channel. Super thanks, Super Chat, uh, direct donation through PayPal. But the best way, of course, is membership, becoming a member of the Rabid Nation, and becoming a citizen in the Rabid Nation is your best way to support the channel. Minimum level, two bucks, and then the rest of it is a little higher depending on what perks and privileges you want. 
I'm also uh, working on hopefully getting some Merck within the next few weeks, and I'm still working on my Amazon wish list and a few other things to support the channel when those pop up. They'll be available, assuming, of course, I still have some subscribers after today. <laughs> um, so we'll see what happens. Um, and yeah, so thanks to all my members. Love you guys. Thank you. You really motivate me to do my best work. Thank you very much. Hope you're down with a little political commentary, but religion and politics always tend to seem to go hand in hand. So sooner or later, you end up talking about it anyway. Uh, thanks once again for stopping by. Uh, make you know, As always, make sure that you're living your best life, that you're giving all your time, money, and opportunities to the people you love and care for and to yourself and to make this a better world. And don't waste it on the trappings of religion and faith because that's a dead end. I speak from experience. And as always, thanks for stopping by, and I'll catch you next time.